So one of the more common things to read in newspapers and articles, especially during a presidential um, election year, especially during a presidential um, election cycle, we're going to get a bunch of polls of approval. Now, technically, polls of approval for a president are taken pretty much every three months to kind of gauge how the, you know, the United States thinks the president's doing. So they would ask a question like, do you think the president is handling the economy? Is it good or is it um, bad? So it only has two possible choices. That's what it means for binomial. So you're either talking about its event or its complement. So a bunch of people are going to say book good and a bunch of people are going to say bad. And then let's just look at the probability of good because that's usually what these polls lean towards. So if you asked 100 people whether this is a good handling of the economy or a bad handling of the economy, it is possible to have all of your respondents say bad and therefore you would be at this end of the spectrum. And it is possible that all 100 people that you called and asked this question answered that the president is doing good on the economy. So that gives you a, a nice range. Now, the likelihood of that happening is obviously going to be very low because you're randomly calling these people. So what happens is, sure, the data could be, you know, you could get a zero for, you know, a couple people and a hundred for other people. But when we start looking at a bunch of samples of the same question over um, different samplings of people, what you would expect is most of the answers would start landing around 50. And when they start landing around 50, you're squeezing in on a specific number of all of these samples that we're taking and their means being really, really close to 50. And when we do this, what happens to the um, normal distribution, let me pull up a picture, is that when we start packing the data really, really close to the middle of the possibilities, then the standard deviations are generally going to get small, the curve gets really tall, and all the information is really tightly packed. So what we call this is the mean of the means. So if uh, one sampling, you have a 40% um, approval rate for the president's handling of the economy, and then another sampling has a 60% of the president's handling of the economy, and then you just keep doing a bunch of calls to different groups of people, you'll find that the true mean of the population is going to be contained rather close to two standard deviations away from the mean. Remember, each one of these dots is a standard deviation. So this would be, if we're two standard deviations away, approximately 95% of the population will be within these bounds. And this is where we get polls that say things like 40% of the population approves of the president's handling of the economy. And then in little parentheses, it'll say plus or minus 3%. And that plus or minus 3% is trying to contain this true mean. And there's other applications that we can do to it. So knowing that these standard deviations are going to be really small and they're based on um, the probabilities of events, then we get this sigma, and we're going to call this sigma, um, I really shouldn't call it sigma, but I wanted it to be different than the standard deviation s. The sigma of this type of thing, of the mean of the means, is going to be the probability of the event, 100 minus the probability of the event, also known as its complement, divided by how many people we're actually asking this question of. All right, so this is the formula that we're going to work with for a little bit, and it's based off of the central limit theory. There is much more to this theorem. Um, this is just a very small part of it, so we can start talking about how do pollsters work and how do they find the margin of error. This is an example of a possible way of using um, polls. 
Um, previous study or a previous poll was conducted and found that 17% of high school seniors smoked. So this would be a published article where someone collected data from many different schools and looked at the uh, percentage for smokers in each one of these schools and then you know found their means. So this would be the mean of the means is 17%. Um, and a counselor at another school wants to find out if this information is correct in within their school. So they took a survey of 75 seniors to find out if they smoked or not. So again, this is a binomial. You either smoke or you don't. So what would be the standard deviation of this poll? I really should um, write this correctly first. Um, based on the previous one. Now, you have to base it on a previous one because you're only doing one uh, set of data rather than studying many different high schools. So here um, in the formula, P being the probability of the event of a student smoking is going to be 17%. Now this formula is based on percent, so don't be changing them to um, decimal points. And then, therefore, 100 minus P is going to equal, what's that, 83? So 83% of the most schools' populations don't smoke. So if we're looking for the standard deviation, we're just going to plug our information into our formula. P times 100 minus P all divided by N. And we're finding that this is going to be 17 times 83 divided by 75 seniors. That's what we're talking about with N. N is the number of people we actually ask the question to. So this would be 75. So when you type this in a calculator, you're going to do the square root symbol. It should give you, if you have the TI30X2S, it should give you the leading parentheses. If your calculator does not give you a leading parentheses, make sure you put one. And then inside it, you're just going to go 17 times 83 divided by 75 and end your parentheses. Um, so be really careful with square roots on different calculators operate a little strange. Some only take the first number it sees and then everything else is outside the square root. So it's really important for those parentheses. So let's see what this is equal to. Uh, 1783 75. 1783 75 and a square root over all of them. So 4.3. So the standard deviation of this information that he would expect would be 4.3%. So if your mean is 17%, then one standard deviation above the mean is going to be 4.3 plus 17 for 21.3 percent. And one standard deviation below the mean, uh, I'm not going to do that in my head, 17.3, uh, or 17 minus 4.3 is 12.7. So it kind of gives us an idea. Now this would be 68 percent of the time he would expect his high school to be within these percentages of smoking. Um, and later we'll play around with this idea a little bit more. So another question we can ask is, what if he found, or the counselor found, let's change the color. So let's say the counselor found that only 5% of the high school seniors smoked. What is the probability of this actually happening based on the previous study? So the previous study said P was equal to 17%. We're going to let that equal X bar. We found the standard deviation to be 4.3%. And using that information, and the 5% being, let's say, X, if you don't know where I'm going with this, uh, x bar, a standard deviation, and x, if we put them together, that's usually a z-score. So we'll have z is equal to x minus x bar over the standard deviation, uh, represented by sigma this time. So we'll have z is equal to x, which is 5, minus x bar, which is 17, 
and then divide it by the standard deviation of 4.3. This might even go off the charts. So 5 minus 17 over 4.3. Negative 2.8. So this is a z-score of negative 2.8. So here we have a z-score of negative 2.8 for a 5% chance of senior smoking. So the probability that it's actually less than negative uh, 2.7 is 0.35% of the time, which is very, very low. So basically what this is saying is uh, if we're that far away from the published 17%, it is a very unlikely chance that it's actually happening. And this counselor can pretty much be confident that seniors that smoked might have lied so that they wouldn't be telling their counselor that they were smokers for one reason or another. So this is one um, possible application of the central limit theory. It allows you to do a study and check its validity um, based on a previous study. So let's go back to that poll that you might read in a newspaper that says that the president um, approval rating is at, oh, let's say 47%. But then after it, it'll say something like, plus or minus 3%. And then it might also tell you how many people were in the survey. Now having all of that information is really important. So if an article just says the president approval rate is at 47%, that doesn't tell you a lot because they could have been surveying um, just 100 people and only 47 of them approved. But if they expanded it to 1,000 people, it might have changed the percentage based on our formula uh, of, uh, you know, the square root of P, P, 100 minus P, all divided by N. When N gets larger here for the standard deviation, then the standard deviation is actually going to get smaller, so it forces everything closer to the middle. So without knowing either the error or the number of people in the survey, the article actually loses a lot of its uh, punch. And I would start not really believing the percentages that they're throwing at us. So having those three pieces of information, or at least two of them, is really important. All right, so when we say the president approval rating is at 47%, plus or minus 3%, what that means is the low bound is going to be 47 minus 3%, and the upper bound is going to be 47 plus 3 percent. So the lower bound means that, um, let's see, this would be 44. So from 44 percent all the way up to 50 percent is the true presidential approval rating for the entire country. It's somewhere between these two numbers. Um, and then there has to be another number associated with this with 95% confidence. And all that means is there is a 5% chance that it is greater than 50 or less than 44. In other words, 2.5% for both sides, basically the tails. So it has a tail error of 5%. So this just tells us, you know, how confident are we that the a president approval rate is at 47%, somewhere between 44 and 50%. All right, so that's all margin error is. It allows us to um, deal with relating a sample's values and expectations to an entire population with some bounds in place. So we're going to find an approximation formula. If we is equal to It depends a lot of, about what n is equal to and a few other things like um, the probability of the event actually happening, uh, of the approval rating being you know, anywhere between 0% and 100%.
So a couple things we're going to um, put in place. We're going to let P equal 50%. So this is where a lot of the approximation is going to happen. When we do a poll like the presidential approval rating, it's very rare for it to be really far away from 50%. So the numbers generally bounce back and forth between 40 and 60 um, for the entire country. So if we make P equal to 50%, we're just aiming for the middle. So that also means that 100 minus P is going to equal 50%, because 100 minus 50 is 50. And the other thing that we have to talk about is this 95% um, confidence level. Remember that it is two standard deviations away in both directions. So it's down two standard deviations and it's up two standard deviations and that'll contain 95% of the possibilities. All right, so with these kind of things in place, and I know that these are standard deviations, and we have this formula, P 100 minus P all over N. If we replace a few things, I know I wanna go two standard deviations away, so the error that we're going to be looking for is going to equal um, plus or minus two standard deviations of P, which I made 50, of P, 100 minus P, which I made 50, and we're going to divide that by the number of people that we're going to survey. All right, now the square root of 50 times 50 is just, well, 50, and 2 times 50 is 100. So we find this error is going to equal now this plus or minus just means plus two, minus two. It's two separate numbers. One moves it to the right, kind of like the 47 plus three of the, you know, the top of the page here. And then the other one moves it to the left, which would have been the 47 minus three. So that's all the plus or minus means. And then two times the square root of 50 squared being 100. And then that square root of n just stays in place. So this becomes the formula to find out what is that plus or minus percent going to be. So let's go back to our high school counselor that surveyed 75 of the seniors in the high school. So if this poll was conducted with 75 people, I want to know what the error of the poll would be. And this is, of course, with 95% confidence. I might as well write that in, 95% confidence since the formula was based on uh, 95%. So our formula, the error is equal to plus or minus 100 over the square root of n, is going to become uh, plus or minus 100 over the square root of 75. So we would expect the error of this poll, as small as it is, to be rather large. So 100 divided by the square root of 75. It's 11.5. So even with this, this is 11.5 percent error. We kind of know that her um, 5 percent possibility is a little weird because with 11.5 percent error, if we do 5 percent um, as our uh, value and then we subtract our error from it, which is 11.5%, this is going to become a negative percent, which is impossible. So zero becomes her lower bound. And then if you take her, uh, the studies value of 17%, uh, I'm sorry, her studies thing of 5%, and you add on the error of 11.5%, this is equal to 16.5% which is actually closer to the 17% that the study actually has. So because this one ended up being a little strange, kind of also gives her an indication that her study is a little bit off kilter. So let's do one that has um, numbers that we can actually work with. Let's say we polled 350 people and we're asking whether they drank milk or not. So it found 43% of the people they called um, actually did drink milk and not like soy milk or something like that. So what is the error of this poll? So 
the error formula being plus or minus 100 over the square root of n becomes plus or minus 100 over the square root of 350. Now remember, the bigger the number in the bottom, the smaller the error is going to be because if you divide by a larger number, your answer is going to get, well, smaller. So what's 100 divided by the square root of 350? So my error here is only 5.3. So this error is plus or minus 5.3%. So if we were going to expand this um, study to represent the entire population of the United States, then we would have to take the 43% that drink milk and subtract 5.3% for our lower bound, and then take 43% our study found, and add 5.3% for our upper bound. So let's see, 43 minus 5.3 is 37.7, and the upper bound would be 48.3. So we would expect the true population's percent of people drinking milk to be somewhere between 37.7% to 48.3% with 95% confidence. So it is possible by 5% that it's not between these two numbers. And that's all this statement says. So it's not a hard concept to you know, get across. Most people have a hard time with the adding and subtracting, but once they see it a few times, it is actually kind of simple. You're just pushing the number to the left and pushing the number to the right and creating this space where possibilities exist. Now, if we want to determine, like if you have a pollster that wants a specific um, error for a study, they could also use this formula to figure out how many people should they call so that their error is like 3% or 2%. They want it to be a you know, specific value. So first thing off, since the number of people can only be positive, this uh, plus or minus becomes irrelevant. So let's change our formula to this. And I'm more interested in solving for n in this case. So to solve for n, I'm just going to do the algebra. You don't have to worry about being able to do this, um, but it does give you an idea of where all this stuff comes from. I need to get the square root of n out of the bottom, so I'm going to multiply both sides by square root of n. Totally legal. These two will cancel. And on the left-hand side, we're going to have the error times the square root of n is equal to 100. Now remember, we're trying to get that n by itself, so I'm going to divide both sides by e, the error. And I'm going to get uh, the square root of n by itself, the e's are going to cancel. So we're going to square root of n is equal to 100 divided by the error. And one thing that algebraically would help here is to get rid of that square root of n, and to do that, we're going to square both entire sides. So when you square both sides, the square root and the square kind of go poof, and we are left with uh, this formula, that if you're looking for the number of people to poll to find that number with a specific number or a specific error, you would do 100 over E and take that answer and square it. So let's say you want a 4% error. If you want a 4% error, then n is going to equal 100 divided by 4 squared. So n is going to equal 25 squared, and that's equal to 625. So if you want a 4% error, you would have to survey 625 people or more. I mean, we can get smaller than 4%, that would be better. Generally, you don't want to go larger. All right, the last topic of this module is correlation. 
Now, correlation is just the relationship um, between two variables or things. So there's two ways you can have a correlation between two concepts. Um, one of them is considered a positive correlation. And that basically means as one gets big, the other gets big. So probably um, the easiest one to make an example of this is kind of like when you're driving. So if you drive um, at 55 miles per hour um, for three hours, then uh, your distance is going to be some fixed number. Let's see, three times 55, 50, 165. So that'd be 165 miles of travel. And if you drove 55 miles per hour for five hours, then we would expect that to go up by 110. So that would be 275 miles that you would have traveled. So basically what I'm trying to get across here is as my time goes up, my distance also goes up. So these two values, time and distance in this case, have a positive correlation. So basically we're looking for um, what happens if I take one quantity and make it larger, does the other one also get larger? So one way of looking at these to see if there's a positive or the other one being a negative correlation between two concepts is to kind of keep in your mind this idea of more or less. So a clothing store will sell more or less, and this is our question, um, winter coats as the temperature increases. So one of the variables is increasing. So to keep this as a positive correlation, if the temperature is increasing, are the uh, winter coats being sold more frequently or less frequently? And you basically just have to keep this really simplistic. If the temperature is increasing getting ready for spring, you would think most clothing stores would sell less. Now, because this one is increasing and we're talking about selling less clothes, these two variables are not going up at the same time because positive correlations are as one gets big, the other one gets big also. So this is what's considered a negative correlation. And that's all you really have to check between positive and negative correlation is the idea of what's going on as you increase one, does the other one also increase or does it decrease? And sometimes you have to think about what's going on um, between the variables a little bit more um, explicitly.